Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's sci-fi seminar series presentation on the safety considerations for food, home canned food. My name is Paresh Gandhi, and I'm a member of the Professional Development Committee at Cypher Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin with today's presentation, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session, you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. It is now my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Nagma Parto. Nagma Parto is a senior program specialist in environmental and occupational health and Public Health Ontario. Prior to joining PHO, Nagma worked at the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care as a senior program consultant and at local health unit as a public health inspector in both environmental health and communicable diseases programs. Nagma has a master's in science in food science, food safety, and quality assurance from the University of Guelph. Thank you, Fresh, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're from. Um, today we will be talking about safety consideration of home canned food. Next slide, please. So we are going to briefly talk about home canning. We're going to talk about why we are uh, uh, considering safety uh, procedures for canning because of illnesses and outbreaks that have been associated. So we are going to go through some of these illnesses and find out why these illnesses have happened. Are there any things that have been outlined that can be addressed during home canning? We're gonna take a step back and look at some of the favorable conditions that uh, pathogens require to grow in food and how we can basically manipulate them in home canning to prevent the growth of pathogens. Then we're gonna go back to home canning and review the different methods of home canning. And we will look at things such as available water and pH that would affect the home canning. Then we're going to talk about validated recipe and why are they important for home canning and concluded with some of the recorded errors that have been noticed during home canning process and how to avoid them. And then we're gonna do a case study in which all of you would be a health inspector and we'll go through this case study to make sure that we understand what was happening and basically uh, conclude ev everything together. So the next slide, please. So uh, canning is actually an old technology. Um, however, in the past few years, home canning have been regaining popularity in Ontario. Canning actually goes back all the way to 18th century when Napoleon Bonaparte offered 12,000 francs to improve food preservation methods of the time. And he really did that because his soldiers were dying from food poisoning rather than the war. So um, he basically had this award for anyone who can come up with a technology that can preserve food. And Nicholas Apert, who was actually a chef, answered this call by developing the first commercial home canning process. And since then, home canning industry has grown rapidly. Right now, it's a multi-billion dollar business. However, the actual principle of home canning from Napoleon, uh, from the time of Napoleon Bonaparte to now has not really changed much. Home canning is really a method of food preservation where food is treated by application of heat alone or in combination with pH, acidity, and also uh, heat. And then the food is stored in a hermetically sealed container. It's meant to be a way to preserve food by packing them into glass jar and heating the jars to eliminate the microorganism that would create spoilage. Next slide, please. 
However, ironically, even though it was first introduced to prevent foodborne illness, if it's not done properly, it can actually cause illnesses. In fact, we have had a number of food recalls associated with home canned food. Some of them were actually initiated by Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs when they were doing their uh, sampling at farmers market. And in these outbreaks and illnesses, the shelf stable home canned food that contained low acid foods such as vegetables were mostly the ones that were implicated. Next slide, please. So as you might have already guessed, botulism, Clostridium botulinum is the pathogen is most associated with these outbreaks. The bacterium is found are in soil and it's prevalent, prevalent in the environment. This pathogen can produce a toxin that causes the botulism. Botul uh, that causes botulism, botulism, botulism. Botulism is a paralytic disease that causes uh, paralyzed, paralyzing a person basically. Some of the symptoms include uh, double or blurred vision, droopy eyelids, slurred speech. It sort of sounds like the person is uh, drunk and have too much to drink. Uh, this can uh, also proceed to having difficulty swallowing, swallowing, dry mouth, muscle weakness, and if it is untreated, it can cause paralysis and also ultimately death. The spores of this pathogen, which are prevalent in the environment, and also the toxin are resistant to freezing temperature. However, um, um, this pathogen, the spores cannot go and germinate unless they're in a low acid food with an equilibrium pH of less than uh, four, uh, more than 4.6 and in an anaerobic environment, meaning an environment that has less than 2% oxygen at a temperature between four to 50 usually. However, having said that, a certain strain of this pathogen, Clostridium botulinum type E, can go at temperatures below four. So it can go at temperatures just above three degrees degree Celsius. Next slide, please. So as we said previously, there have been outbreaks associated with foodborne illness. There are actually a number of outbreaks, uh, foodborne illness associated with home canned food. There's actually a number of outbreaks that have been recorded uh, throughout the years. These are just some of those outbreaks that I have pointed down here. As you can see, the home canned foods that are associated with these outbreaks are mostly low acid foods, or uh, they're, uh, they're mostly uh, high, uh, low acid foods or foods that are just at the cost of the pH of 4.6. And these outbreaks can have a small number of cases because it's a food that was uh, produced by a family that was consumed, or it can be large because it's a home canned food that have been distributed largely through either internet or through um, um, through farmers markets or different uh, restaurants. And looking at the risk factors associated with all these outbreaks, when noted, we see that inadequate pH of the final product and also not enough temperature treatment have been the main two causes, root causes of these outbreaks. Next slide, please. So now let's take a step back and look at some of the characteristics that influence the growth of pathogens. Because if we understand this, then we would be able to manipulate these in order to make the food safe. So in food science, we refer to these characteristics as fat tongue. That stands for food, acidity, pH level, uh, which is the pH level, time, temperature, oxygen, and moisture. Basically, food refers to available nutrients that is in the food or in order for pathogens to use and go and multiply. 
microorganisms like us like food as well too and they like food such as uh, they uh, go very well in foods that are high in protein uh, such as milk meat fish acidity is another factor most pathogens grow well at level pH levels between 4.6 to 7.5, and they can thrive between 6 to uh, 6.6 to 7.5. Time refers to how long a food can stay at certain temperature before the pathogens can grow in that. That's related to the log time of each pathogens at different temperatures, meaning how long would take for one log increase in the pathogen. Temperature refers to what temperatures pathogens grow best at. Generally, foodborne pathogens grow between 4 to 60 degrees Celsius. Having said that, some pathogens can grow outside this temperature zone. The next one is oxygen. That refers to availability of oxygen or not, which is aerobic and anaerobic. So depending on the pathogens you're looking at and you're trying to control, you can have an aerobic environment where pathogens can grow or anaerobic. For example, clustered in botulinum, even though the spores are prevalent in the environment, because they only grow in an anaerobic environment in lack of oxygen, they would not go and multiply and they won't pose any risk. But when you put it in a canned product when there is no oxygen or less than 2% and it's hermetically sealed, then they can go and multiply. Whereas pathogens such as, say, Campylobacter, they need to have oxygen in order to go and multiply. The next thing, the characteristic that influence growth of pathogen is moisture, which we refer to as available water in food. Most pathogens require more than available water above 0.85 in order to grow. But then most of the canned food do have available water over 0.85. Next slide, please. So keeping the fat tom in mind, let's look at what are the microbial growth conditions that we are using to control to produce kimchi that would be safe for consumption. So is it temperature, acidity, and oxygen? Is it food temperature and uh, food temperature and oxygen? Is it food, acidity, and oxygen? Is it temperature, moisture, and time? Or is it acidity, food, and time? Or is it none of the above? Let's take a couple of seconds to answer this. So most the temperature, acidity, and oxygen, and followed by a tie between food, acidity, and oxygen. Actually, the correct answer is E, acidity, food, and time. The reason for that is kimchi, even though it looks like a canned food, it's actually not a canned food, it's a fermented food. With fermentation, we use a culture microorganisms that are not harmless. And in this case, these are acidic, produ acidic producing uh, pathogen uh, microorganisms such as lactic acid bacteria that all compete with the pathogens for availability of food. And during that process, they also release acid that brings the acidity of food down to, uh, for kimchi, it's around three, 3.5. Uh, to four. So, and uh, we do want to have the drop in pH very rapidly so that the pathogens won't have the time to grow. So that's why it's acidity, food, and time. So it's important to under, when you look at the product to understand how it has been produced and what technology has been used in order to understand how to control and make sure that the product is safe. Next slide, please. So now that we know what to look for, let's look at different methods for home canning. 
Home canning is usually used by two methods. First one is the boiling water canning, in which the jars are put in a boiling water bath and cooked to 100 degrees Celsius at sea level. This is used by uh, for food that are either high acid or acidified, meaning they have a P equilibrium pH of less than 4.6. This is usually what we mostly see with home canning. The other one is the pressure canners. That's used for low acid food, where the equilibrium pH is above 4.6 and the water activity is above 0.85. This canning process um, aims to provide commercial sterility. And it's usually not recommended for inexperienced canners because it's more difficult. Next slide, please. So we keep on talking about acidified and acidic food and low acid food. What do we mean by that? Acidic food is basically a food that naturally have a low pH, meaning equal less than 4.6. Uh, an example of that would be most of the fruit that we deal with and we can. For example, strawberries, apples, and peaches all have a pH of anywhere between 3, 3.3 to about 4.5 max. But then we also do have fruit that have a higher pH. For example, bananas have pH of 4.5 to 5.2, and cantaloupe has a pH of 6.1 to 6.61. However, having said that, I haven't seen any canned bananas or canned cantaloupe. Okay. Acidified food refers to a food that is not acidic, but we have added an um, acidulant or acid food to it to bring the equilibrium pH again to below 4.6. And it has an available water of over 0.85. An example of that would be your pickled vegetables like pickled beans. And an example of acidulant is your typical vinegar, lemon juice, citric acid, anything like that. Now, low acid food is the group of food that have uh, available uh, equilibrium pH of over 4.6 and also available water of over 0.85. These are the food that you need to have uh, an experienced canner canning them using a pressure canner. Example of that would be your butterscotch soup, any of your meat soups. These are the ones that are low acid food and also there's no acidulants added to them. Next slide, please. So we keep on talking about pH, just to um, remind everyone, pH is the measure of acidity or alkalinity of food. The scale runs from one to 14, uh, zero to 14. Um, the lowest the pH would be the more acidic and the higher would be more basic. And we usually use pH meter to measure that. Um, looking at this, for example, the battery would be the most acidic that item that we can think of, and the drain cleaner would be the uh, more, most alkaline. Um, your tomatoes that are mostly, mostly canned would fall right at the cusp of the 4.6. So depending on the type of tomato, it can be less than 4.6 and some tomatoes are over 4.6. That's why when you see a home canned recipe for tomato that is validated, a lot of times they do include addition of an acidulant such as lemon juice or vinegar. Next slide, please. So we keep on talking about equilibrium pH. So equilibrium pH is the pH of the food product after the added acid has evenly distributed and equilibrated with the food. Usually when you're, te when that's test when you're testing for the equilibrium pH, we don't test the pH of the product right after the canning is done. We usually wait for 24 hours after the food has sat at room temperature and has had the chance to stabilize. So looking at this scale, the equilibrium pH of a lot of jams and jellies are around three. 
relishes and salsas and pickled vegetables are also around four, uh, below 4.6, whereas your puree vegetables and soups that have no acidulant fall at the other side. Now, equilibrium pH is usually obtained through a lab and not by the operator. The reason for that is most of the time the lab has to take the product and basically blend it and then test it. Next slide, please. So talking about that, let's do a quick test to see which of these products would be acidic, acidified, or low acid. So chicken soup, is it acidic, acidified, or low acid? It should be really easy. Can we see the results? Perfect, everyone got it right. So it is a low acid food because um, chicken is a meat product which has a higher pH, which has a, a pH of, I believe it's around fast six. I have to double check that actually. Uh, next product is pickled egg. Again, acidic, acidified, or low acid food. Perfect. Yes, it is acidified food. Pickles are not acidic. However, we add um, something um, acidulant, such as vinegar and um, lemon juice, in order to bring the acidity of the product, equilibrium acid, uh, pH of the product down to less than 4.6. Next one is uh, applesauce. Again, acidic, acidified, or low acid. Let's check the poll. Yes, it is acidic. Apples have acidity of over three and below four. So next slide, please. We also talk a lot about available water. And why are we concerned about available water in home canning? Basically, available water is defines the amount of water in your food and ingredients that is available to microorganisms to use and go and multiply. That's different from moisture. Moisture is the amount of food in general in your water, and not all of that uh, water would be available for microorganism growth. So basically, the available water is the ratio of vapor pressure of water in food to vapor pressure of pure water at the same temperature. As we said before, it's between one, 0 to 1, pure water having 1. And water activity meter is usually used to measure the available water. Most canned food would have available water of over 0.85. And the reason we say 0.85 is because most pathogens can't grow over at P uh, available water below 0.85. But then having said that, most of our foods such as raw meat, fish, fresh fruit and veggies have available water of anywhere between 0.98 to 0.99. And things such as bread, ham, cheeses, and even fermented sausages and salamis have available water that is over 0.85. Looking at things that are less than 0.85, sometimes some of our jams and marmalades have available water of less than 0.85. And the other things are spices, dry fruit, crackers, or cereal, which are highly that we would can. So moving forward to the next slide, please. We also talked about commercial sterility and how when we are canning using pressure canners, we want to obtain commercial sterility. Any guesses as to what that would be? Is it using utensils that are sterile, using approved chemicals to sterilize the canning uh, equipment, applying condition that reduces microorganism capable of growing during the storage of canned food? None of the above or all of the above? The correct answer is actually C. So um, commercial, next slide, please. So commercial sterility is actually defined as uh, 
by a codex elementary is the condition that is achieved by application of heat, which renders such food free of microorganisms capable of growing in food at temperatures at which food is likely to be held during distribution of food. Basically, how long at to what temperature should you boil or heat treat the food, the canned food, in order to make sure you have basically eliminated the pathogens that can go and multiply and make people sick. In this case, it would be the spores of the Clostridium botulinum. So the heat process that is required to make low acid canned foods commercially sterile would depend on the microbial load, it depends on the storage temperature, which in terms of canned food, it would be at room temperature, the presence of various preservatives. For example, if it is acidic or not, if it is acidic, then you need quite lower temperature uh, because you don't need to deactivate the uh, spores. Um, it depends on water activity. Again, if it is less than 0.85, that's fine. You don't need anything. Uh, composition of food products and also the container size and type. Um, the one thing to bear in mind is that commercial, when you say that the product is commercially sterile, it doesn't mean that all the pack, all the microorganisms have been uh, deactivated. You can still have a small number of thermophilic bacteria and spores. These uh, bacteria and spores do not cause illness, but they can cause spoilage. That's why there is usually a shelf life of about one year for canned products. Next slide, please. So we keep on talking about validated recipe. You hear about that all the time to use a validated recipe. What does it really mean? So a validated recipe is really a formulation and accompanying schedule process that has been scientifically determined to be adequate in ensuring a shelf-stable product that is free of pathogen and controls the risk of spoilage. It requires extensive experiments and analyzing it in the lab. Basically, it's essential to use these recipes and processing instructions that are current and scientifically tested. The reason for that is when you do that, these recipes take into account what composition of food, what ingredients should be put in the food. How do you need to prepare it? How long to cook it? it establishes the dimensions of the container of the containers. So how big the container should be, for what how, how long, for what, how long it would be uh, heat treated and for how, uh, at what temperature. And basically at the end of that, it would give you a schedule process that is specific to that recipe. So if you follow that, you would be having a uh, product that would be safe. But any adjustment will, this recipe and uh, this uh, validated recipe can cause problems. For example, if you add more starch or thickening agent in the recipe, it will change the amount of heat penetration to the product, and it can result to underheating, uh, under processing, and not getting enough heat treatment. Next slide, please. So. Um, when I get requests from the field, I quite often get requests asking me, where do we find validated recipe? How do we validate recipe? Um, there's actually a lot of resources on the internet for validated recipes. Uh, for example, the National Center for Home Preservation has a number of validated recipes. Ball Corporation Canning Guide has also a number of recipes. Bern Bernadine, Home canning also has a number of validated recipes. In addition to these, there's a number of university extensions, such as uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, Michigan, and also Illinois, that have validated recipes on their website. Next slide, please. So what does validating a recipe involves? 
One of the things that validating a recipe involves is validation of thermal process. In doing so, um, uh, 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 in doing so and uh, validate uh, and doing a validation study, a lab uh, that is qualified basically would do a health penetration studies that will use the scientifically determined safe processing time for establishing a time temperature requirement at the slowest heating point of the food, which is referred to as cold spot, for a specific container size and shape. If a specific thermal process is not calculated, then we can have a, pro uh, a product that would be under processed and it would be prone to having the pathogens go and multiply. Next, uh, next slide, please. So when this process is done, then you get a scheduled process. This schedule process again gives you the length of time that the food must be processed at a specific temperature and pressure to achieve a commercial sterility. The factors that influence this schedule process involves the pH of the initial ingredient of the food, the composition of food, how much of what food you put in. Uh, uh, it depends on the size of the particulates of the food. It depends on the viscosity of the product. It depends on tightness of how you pack the product. It depends on if you, for example, have any fats, starches, uh, hydrocolloids, any things like that that would affect it, that heat transferability. It also depends on how you hit, uh, apply the thermal processing. Is it connect convective or conductive transfer of heat? It also depends on if you are hot packing or cold packing. So it depends on the temperature that the food is filled into the jars. It also depends on the process temperature and pressure. Are you doing boil water canning or pressure canning? And it again depends on the size, shape, and uh, size of the container that you're using. So failure to properly formulate and process canned food can have potentially negative and dangerous consequences. So that's why it's important that we have canned products that have followed a validated recipe. Next slide, please. So looking at the outbreaks that has happened and also reports of uh, food recalls that we have got from different food processing plants, as to what has gone wrong to resolve in the recall. These are some of the things that common uh, errors that have been identified. So the first one is a lack of using a validated process. The second one is a change in the formulation and viscosity of the product. For example, um, a person decides to make their uh, product more healthier. So they add less salt and add more, say, ginger. So that would change the pH of the product. And as a result, the product would not be safe. Um, equipment error, for example, um, temperature processing time, failure to calibrate the product, using wrong container size, uh, changing the head space, which is the unfilled space from the top of the jar to the bottom, or to the uh, food or liquid in the jar. Um, for example, if you are under processing it for temperature, you can have other pathogens that can go and multiply, or you can have yeast and mold that can go and multiply. And as a result of them growing, they can increase the pH of the product that could result in then the uh, clostridium botulinum spore to be able to go and multiply and produce toxin. The other thing is to failure to write the instructions. So having a validated recipe is great, but if you don't actually have a process chart and you don't know, follow it, then you can have problems. And also to failure to review records. Um, for example, you have it written, but you actually are not looking at it. And the other thing is failure to act on adverse records. For example, um, you know that 
your pro your uh, equipment have not been calibrated, but you don't have time to do that. And you use it as is, and it can result in under uh, temperature, under processing of the canned food. Next slide, please. So now that we have done this, let's do a quick case study to review what we have talked about. Now, for the purpose of this case study, you will all be health inspectors for the next 10 to 15 minutes. So put on your health inspector hats and let's go on. Next slide, please. So it's Friday afternoon and you get a call from a resident in a rural area telling you that they're planning to sell canned crushed tomato online and also in the local market. Mrs. Kenneth is very proud of her product. She has been making these canned, uh, canned crushed tomatoes for a long time and she's been making pastas and different dishes and she's been getting compliments from her friends and family that this is great. So now she is retired and she wants to supplement her income and she's bored. So she wants to share this great recipe and this great product with her community. So this is her grandma's recipe and she's hoping that if the business picks up, she would also do more products because she also has a lot of recipes uh, passed on from generation for uh, canned um, uh, pickled vegetables and also soups and etc. So she's calling to make sure that she's following everything and has all the safety requirements that is needed by the health unit. So next slide, please. So having heard that, what would you do? Do you wish her good luck and ask her to send you a couple of jars of tomatoes so you can use it for your Christmas hot dog dinner? Uh, tell her this is really a small production business and needs to get licensed by Ontario Ministry of Health, uh, Ontario Biomafra, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. You ask for the recipe, the source of the recipe, food safety plan, and any other information regarding the processing that she has. You make arrangement to visit Ms. Canet and review the process, A and B or C and D. Let's take a couple of seconds to answer that. Yes, C and D. Perfect, so everyone is right. You're good inspectors. Next slide, please. So Monday morning, first thing you visit Ms. Uh, Kenneth and you review what she's doing. And you find out that Ms. Kenneth has been using his, uh, the family recipe that has been passed around for many years for canning tomatoes and vegetables. She also has no understanding of what HACCP is, what are food safety plans and what are the potential risks associated with canning. All she knows is that she has been canning for a number of years. Her mother has been canning for a number of years. Her grandmother has been canning for a number of years. And no one has had any problem with that. And everyone loves all the food that she makes with these canned products. And for the canned tomatoes, she uses them to make pastas and other dishes. And she applies it as part of the ingredient. And then they, she cooks these products for a long time. Say for pasta sauce, she said that she lets the pasta sauce boil for about an hour and a half, for lasagna is an hour in the oven for at 400 degrees Celsius, et cetera, et cetera. And she's very nice and she's even willing to share her recipes for her pasta and um, other dishes with you. Moving on to the next slide. So this is the recipe that she has. She tells you that this is from her grandma. However, her grandma used um, sterilized uh, one quart jars, but she has run out of it, so she's been using half a liter and one liter jars. Um, she also uses um, tomatoes, whatever that is on sale, and it varies from time to time. 
And um, the one thing that she says is that she wants to be very safe and she knows that pH is important. So her grandson is a lifeguard with a local uh, community pool. So she has asked him to give him some uh, pH uh, paper and she has been using this PHP paper on the cans that she jars uh, at the end uh, before she uses and she checks the pH with that. But when you ask her what the pH is, she said her grandson said that it's acidic. So moving forward, next slide please. So after reviewing all this information, what are some of the concerns you have with this recipe? No concern, she's been making this for a number of years and there's no problem. She's using the wrong pH strip. She's using different jar sizes that might cause problem. She uses different types of tomatoes or it's not a validated recipe. Let's see the poll please. Yes, um, the answer is it's, she's not using a validated recipe, even though yes, she's using the wrong pH strip, she's using the different uh, jar sizes, and she's using different tomatoes. So everything is wrong, but ultimately it's the fact that she's not using a validated recipe. So we really don't know what's happening, what's the pH, what's the time requirement. So, um, and also she's saying that she has been using it for many years, so she's arguing about that. But she also told you that she uses this product and then after the, uh, she post, uh, post opening it, she temperature treated. We know that the, even though the spores of the Cosurium botulinum are heat resistant, the toxin itself is heat liable, meaning if you basically temperature treat the toxin at 85 degrees Celsius for over five minutes, it basically deactivates the toxin. So maybe the reason that she's not, ha not, not having, have not been having any problem is because she cooks, the uh, cooks her food with the pathogens toxin for a long time and deactivates the toxin. But again, we really don't know. Moving on to the next slide. So you tell Ms. Cannon that she has to use a validated recipe and she comes up with four different recipes that she has found on the internet. And she basically asks you which one should she use? Is it the crushed cut tomato recipes from All She Can Cook? Website, is it crushed tomatoes canning from food.com? Is it the canned crushed tomatoes from Mountain Mama Cooks? Or is it the canned crushed tomatoes from U of Wisconsin Cooperative Extension? Let's look at the poll, please. Yes, it's the canned crushed tomatoes from University of Wisconsin. Even though if you Google it, you would see the other ones have got better reviews, D would be the option that would be safer. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, recipe from the University of Wisconsin that has been validated. Um, after looking at this, Ms. Cannett decides that using a pressure canner would be too complicated. So she would be the, using the uh, boil water canning. Um, she also be using a half a liter glass jars only. And the new recipe has verified that the pH would be less than 4.6. And it also has the required uh, heating temperature to, uh, and time of 35 minutes for the size that she would be using, whereas her previous recipe was only using only 20 minutes. Also, under this recipe, canned foods can be kept only for one year, and the ingredients include tomatoes, salt, and lemon juice to decrease the acidity. So next slide, please. So you asked Ms. Cannon to come up with a process flow and this is what she has. Having this in mind, next slide please. 
Can you insist, Ms. Kenneth, on where your critical control points would be? Is it on step one? Tomatoes inspected for damage, unwashed, and clean. Step two, dip in boiled water for 60 seconds, then cold in order to remove the skin. Is it step three? Uh, add the crushed tomatoes and boil for five minutes. Is it step four? Hot fill jars with tomatoes and two tablespoons of lemon juice. Is it step five? Remove excess air. Is it step six, process in boiling water for 35 minutes and ensure final pH in less, is less than 4.6. Let's look at the results, please. Okay. The answer is actually A, steps one, three, five, and six. Let's review that. Next slide, please. So step one is inspecting for damaged uh, products and also wash, clean, and sterilize the jars. This is a critical control point because by doing that, you're basically reducing the pathogen load on the product and also on the equipment that you would be using. Next slide, please. Step three and five, are also critical control points using one sixth of the tomatoes while crushing and add the rest for boiling. This heat treatment is again used to further reduce the microbial load and removing access and cap in place is also another um, control measure because it applies appropriate amount of force to seal the jars and make sure that you get the hermetically sealed environment. Next slide, please. And the last slide, uh, the last critical control point and the most important is the boiling water for 35 minutes and also ensuring the pH is less than 4.6. This is what basically makes sure that you get proper temperature treatment that an appropriate pH that would result in prevention of the growth of botulinum spores and production of toxins. Next slide, please. So finally, in summary, if we were to basically learn, uh, take one or two points home, is that you need to start with a validated recipe that would give you a hassle-based food safety plan that would include proper temperature and acidity of the product. And even having that, it's very important to actually follow it and have verification points that show that you are looking at the critical control points in the process and making sure that it has been obtained. Next step, next slide. In summary, I want to acknowledge Robert from OMAFRA. And also, if you like to have more information, Public Health Ontario does have a paper on home canning that is available online. And also more home canning information can be found from the Government of Ontario. The slides would be available later on, so you would have all these links. And thank you. I'll leave the floor to Parash for any questions. Thank you, Nagma. Uh, we will now move to the Q&A pod to address some of the questions. Please continue to enter your questions in the pod if you haven't already done, had an opportunity to do so. So we have a question here, Nagma. Uh, one issue uh, health units face uh, is when working with new operators who want approval for their recipes. So going through the validation process with the lab is that they don't want to give the health unit the recipe as part of the food safety plan. So, you know, some of the stances health units have taken is that they, that, that they need to include ingredients, but they have not pushed for quantities since they're still working with the lab for validation. Should they require full recipes with ingredients and amounts? What are your thoughts on that? Ultimately, you want to make sure that they have a food safety process with the critical point control points. One of the critical control points is to have the ingredients and how much of each ingredient are added. 
Because if you remember, if you change the ingredient of the product, home can product, you can change the pH of the product. So in order for them to have a safe product, part of that is to have the ingredient and how much of the ingredient they're adding. Because we had problems, we had artworks associated with scanned product when people change the ingredient. For example, one of the, in the table that I showed you previously with the outbreaks listed, one of the outbreaks was actually in, um, associated with home can tomato sauce. And it was actually local. It was just north of Ontario. This family has been canning for a number of years. And then they decided to change the type of tomato that they use because they wanted to have it less acidic because they were getting older and they were getting stomach pain because of the, when they had acidic food. So when they did that, because tomatoes were right at the cost and because they changed the recipe ingredients, um, the pH went above 4.6. And as a result, the whole, all of the family and also the people that are over for the Easter lunch that they had got sick and they got concentrated in botulinum and botulism uh, and they ended up in the hospital. So having the ingredient, how much of the ingredient is important and it has to be validated that it's safe and that is actually one of the critical control points. Great, thank you. Can you explain the differences between canning and bottling? For example, if somebody uses pasta sauce, uh, is there fewer steps with regards to bottling and canning? Maybe you can use that as an example. That's actually a good question. Uh, in industry, most a lot of people actually use bottling and canning interchangeably, but they're not the same. So I'm going to actually read something for you from the National Center for Home Preservation. Uh, for food preservation. Uh, they say that many recipes in circulation on, inter on the internet are not really canning as they do not have boil water or pressure canning procedures applied to the filled jar. True home canning is when the food is heated enough to destroy or sufficiently acidic to prevent the growth of all spores of botulinum and also other pathogens during the, the home uh, storage. So if an operator tells you that they're bottling, ask them questions and go through their procedures. They may very well be canning, but they may not. So bottling a lot of times is more of a guesswork, hearsay experience that people do, but then it can also be canning. Again, you have to go back and ask questions. Great, thank you. How can you tell the difference between a fermented and canned product sold at farmer's market if they're both stored in a glass jar? Well, that's a good question. They all look alike. So by looking at them, there's definitely you can say, unless you actually know the product. For example, kimchi is a fermented canned uh, Korean uh, cabbage. So you know it's fermented. But then if you look at pickles, it can be fermented or it can be canned. So again, you don't know unless you actually ask the operator. The one thing that you, um, you can ask is, how do you process it? If there is any heat treatment, it's canned product. If they added any culture or they salted it and they let it sit for at room temperature for 48 hours, sometimes two, three days, then it's fermented. So again, ask questions. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, are all canned foods hermetically sealed? And what the term hermetically sealed would mean? So a true shelf-stable canned food is always hermetically sealed. However, more and more we are seeing people that uh, they do the canning, but then they don't want to hermetically seal it because it takes too much room. So they put it in, um, plastic bag, um, Ziploc bags and put it in the freezer. So that's not really a true canned food, even though they may going to, uh, they may use the canned uh, recipe. And hermetically sealing refers to making an environment that is less than 2% uh, oxygen. Okay, great, thank you. Um, 
We have a question here. Aside from it being a university source, how would a person know a recipe or source is validated? Usually it stays on the website. Uh, and if you have question, you can always uh, ask the website organizers. Um, most of the recipes from food nets um, or other popular recipes are not validated. Next question is, uh, I've heard that turning can uh, can jars upside down is somehow safer. Is this true? This is the first time you want to have a head space that is about a two centimeter, um, which is important. But having the headset head space upside down or not upside down, I really can't tell. Is there a list of labs that do recipe validation available to share with operators? We don't recommend any labs as pH um, because we, can, we can't recommend. But um, when you're looking at a lab, you want to look at a quality assurance lab, a lab that does research, not your regular microbiological lab. Great. A lot Sorry. of universities that have food safety program do have labs as such. Some of the consulting, food safety consulting companies are also associated with labs. Okay, and just one final question. Uh, it says I'm an inspector in Alberta. How, how do you check existing recipes for safety? Um, Mrs. Kennett never wants to change a recipe. Have you got a, a case that you can send out where she doesn't change it and you have to go through the process of ensuring her can method is safe? We had actually inquiries from our health unit that have recipes from a canned product that uh, was not validated, but it was run in their family for a long time. The way that we have actually dealt with it is we have first look at the recipe. For example, if it was for strawberry jam, uh, we know that strawberry is low acid. We know that it's if it does have proper uh, temperature treatments to deactivate the uh, vegetative cells, it's fine. So those are the ones that we sort of work with the operator. Um, but then if you have something that is acidified, such as pickled egg or something that is low acid, they do need, again, to go through a quality assurance lab and get this um, recipe uh, validated. The validation process is a long process. Does it can become expensive? So, what the way we I deal with that is usually to recommend that they look at the validated recipes that are already readily available online. And some of them, believe it or not, looks very much like the grandma's recipes that they're using. So a lot of times when they actually see how expensive this process is and how difficult this process is, they decide to go with a validated recipe that is already available online and is similar to what they do. Great. Um, thank you so much. As we wrap up today's Sci-Fi Ontario seminar series session, I would like to thank Nagma for presenting. I would also like to thank everyone who joined us for today's session. It's so great to see, see so much virtual um, uh, participation even during a challenging time for healthcare professionals. You can expect to receive a brief and anonymous survey for today's session. Please try to complete this and help us improve our programming. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.